you, handsome. He's going to be talking about the fun of living between stereotypes um, and yeah. environmentalism and a lot of fun things that some people really want to talk about and some people don't want to talk about. I guess uh, maybe I want to talk about it. Or, yeah, Randy, you've been bugging me for a while. Oh, Randy does bug. Yeah, perfect. That's actually the slide I wanted. Yeah. Um, Randy, you've been bugging me for a while to, to kind of share a passion of mine. Um, and that's uh, how to kind of have this balance between being socially responsible and being environmentally responsible. Um, so yeah, I, I want to open with that thought. Uh, Jesus replied, love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the basics of being a Christ follower is first love God. You know, and that's that slide, love Jesus. And then love your neighbors. Loving your neighbor is being socially responsible. And I kind of come up with the question, does being environmentally responsible even fit into a Christian's walk? And, um, and I think it does. Our day-to-day -day choices not only affect our neighbors, but the shared environment what we live in. Being environmentally responsible is important because it has a direct impact on our neighbors' day-to-day -day lives. You know, and being environmentally responsible is an interesting topic, and there, there's a good chance as I make my way through this presentation and this breakout afterwards that I'll probably make statements that you may not agree with or that stretches you and, and causes you to wrestle, and I think that's okay, because really that's when God shows up. We're never called to blindly follow people. We always have to weigh people's intent as well as the content. I feel that sometimes we're given information and we don't really look at the intent of that information before we go into the content. Jesus never called us to blindly follow others. We are called to follow him. And before I go much further, I want to pray too. Um, Lord, thank you for these people here. Thank you that they've taken time out of their busy schedules, that they've committed to come here and kind of grow as a community. Thank you for their dedication to spreading their gospel. And I humbly ask that um, as I'm up here sharing that you, you, you really speak through me. And uh, you, you change these words that are floating around our heads to one valuable word in our heart because our heart is really where the change comes in. Amen. So yeah, like Yvonne said, my name is Jake Christensen. Um, I'm not a Bible, biblical scholar. I didn't go to school to teach any of this. I actually went to school for business. Um, Amen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, I'm, but I'm a Christ follower because of this ministry. Um, and so I hold this ministry, you know, as Yvonne was speaking, I think that's kind of why she cried, is that we hold this ministry very dear to our heart. Um, I love the mountain communities where I, live, where I live in. You know, this is one of my community. Part of the other community is those people that call those mountain resorts home. I love the changing seasons. I love snow. There's the answer to that question. I'm a mountain biker. I'm a skier. I like riding lifts, but I also enjoy earning my turns. I enjoy that long walk to get my turns in. I own snowmobiles. I own a big three-quarter ton truck, like big truck to carry the snowmobiles, but I also recycle. I own chainsaws. I like eating meat, but I also really enjoy salads. I own an excavator, but I also like to garden with my hands. I grow stuff to eat. I like the green smoothies in the morning, but I also like coffee. I'm that person that kind of, oh yeah, and I like beer too. Uh, I, I'm this, this person that's labeled as this evil developer because that's part of what my job is. But I also build environmental, sustainable houses. So really, I'm, I'm not really a redneck 
or a hippie. And I find myself living between those labels in life. And I also find myself living in this label of uh, Christian and this opposite other end that's called environmentalist. Um, because a lot of times I don't think these two kind of associate very well. Um, there's a book that SFC has been packing around for, uh, man, like 10 years probably to these conferences. And I actually read it. Um, and I did. Uh, the, the guy's name is Joel Salatin. And why I read it was I was reading this other book called Omnivore's Dilemma. And he's in that book, quoted by that writer. And I was like, here's this Christian writer that was quoted in this very uh, secular environmentalist book. So I picked it up and read it. And I highly encourage you to read it. And Joel kind of lives in the same kind of environment that I do where I'm in this kind of liberal, hippie, kind of environmentalist, care for the earth kind of thing, and then the Christian part. And I find myself in both of those communities, and I, I like both of those communities. And so why does this separation exist? And, and to kind of give in a context of how great the separation is, um, I'm gonna talk briefly here about global warming. So in 2017, there was a survey done and 97.9% .9 of the scientific community agree that climate change is a major threat. In that same survey, half of evangelical Christians say that climate change is not happening. And a quarter of that evangelical Christian group says that humans are partially to blame. And as I was going through that, I, I, I was floored. I was like, I, I guess I was fairly naive in where I lived in the community I was in, and that shocked me and scared me to actually do this presentation, because I, I don't know really where you guys are at, but Randy has been asking me for so long to do this presentation. I said, okay, fine, I'm gonna commit and go through with it. So as I dug deeper, I found this, another study that said, why do evangelical Christians not agree with the general scientific community on global warming? And this is where it got really interesting, and, and people will ask, why do you believe that? And they said that they were afraid by committing to an environmental stance, such as protecting the earth, driving less, and those things, that they would actually be embracing other liberal and social kind of agendas. And those liberal and social agendas were things such as abortion, gay rights, and gun control. Those are the high ones on that list. And those are very, very splitting when it comes to how society views things. And so same, the evangelical Christian said if they would be accepting environmentalism, they'd be accepting all these other liberal kind of thought processes, and they'd be turning their backs on their faith community. So before I continue, I want to kind of say this, and I want to say this twice. I want to assume that the vast majority of climate scientists are not correct for the rest of my presentation. And again, so the, all those climate scientists that said, yes, it's a major threat, that, that they're not right. And so what does that leave us with? Is there another reason to be concerned about our treatment for the natural environment and climate or not if climate change is not real? And I think there is because the scripture that I quoted first was, as you love your neighbor, that's the socially part of life, social responsibility part of life, you have to accept that we all live in the same environment. And so we need to be responsible for that too. So if my life is led by the Holy Spirit, I, I truly believe that we will be producing fruit, right? That's, that's what Paul writes. We can all agree with that. No, yes. Just nod your head like this, yes. So, and those fruits are easy. Like they are basically love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't have time to go through a lot of those, but I want to look at two of them. So patience, it's easy for us to think of patience with others, but what about patience with ourselves? As a Christ follower, it's hard to exercise patience in a culture that we, we live in because it's a culture of immediate, immediate gratification. I, I want something and I get it. So just like Marcus was saying, 
uh, you know what, if you need information, how do we get to the Alpine Adventure Park? What do we do? Exactly, like we can pull out our phone. We don't have to go anywhere and ask anyone for anything. It's just, we can pull out the phone and, and it will answers it. You need directions, Google it. You need information, Google it. It's actually a verb now, I guess. Um, I want to buy something. What do you do? Exactly. And you know what's crazier is that Amazon in a lot of places, not in where I live in Whitefish, Montana, but a lot of places will deliver the same day. Like that just seems weird. Montana, it's like three, four days later if they even find your address. But um, we, we often buy on credit instead of saving up. And again, this is just showing that we, we're kind of being challenged with the idea of patience. We shop at a grocery store instead of gardening. Instead of walking or bike, biking to work, we just get in our trucks and drive. In the mountain communities, it looks like a lot more six-pack high-speed quads instead of tow ropes, T-bars, and fixed grips doubles. Uh, tow rope? Yeah, Midwest. Um, yeah, so those, <laughs> mid Northeast too? Oh my gosh. Not, not in the Western area, it's like tow ropes are like disappearing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So I've made a few adjustments in my life regarding patience. One is in my local commuting. Um, Yvonne and I, we live three miles out of town, um, and we were inspired by uh, some friends, Dave Downing and Jess Downing, um, to start to commute by bike more. And at first I was doing this because I had this environmental stance of like, okay, I'm gonna commute my, my, by my bike, I'm gonna use less gas. And in the process of doing that, guess what? I'm gonna save money too. So it's, that's a win-win. But as I started doing this, we'd run into people like Dorothy, who we bought our land from, and this is an old lady that we bought our land from, and she's walking down the road, and we started carrying on conversations with her. She needed help with firewood. She needed help with dump runs. She was going through cancer and those kind of things. And so that started there. Uh, another friend, Willie and Stella, they are the local owners of the bike and ski shop. They bought a house, um, and it was on our route on the way there. We'd see them on the deck having coffee as we were biking into town to go to work, and we'd stop in and say hi. Um, Burkett and Claire, they also bought a house and it was under construction and we'd stop in and say hi and when we get home, that's where we're going for Thanksgiving. Another aspect was ski touring that I started exercising patience in. The idea is that um, people are, are, are kind of the, you walk up for two to five hours for a three to five minute down, like does that even make sense? Like is there the the... Exactly, right? Like the, the amount of reward for that is not, doesn't compute. But I wouldn't change it for the world. Not only do like, you don't get a ski every slope you look at every time because in the back country you're, you're looking at safety with avalanches and stuff like that. But also the hike up, as you're going up, that two to five hours that you're hiking up, you end up talking with friends about the successes of life, spiritual journeys, the, the failures in life, death, loss, all that kind of stuff. And, and it is, you, you can't run away from the person as you're ski touring with them. Like those conversations happen and, and, and you get to talk about those kind of things. So those are just two examples of my life where I've exercised patience. And I, I realized that the things will take longer, but in most cases, you'll look at it, it's conserving some resources. It'll leave time for reflection and relationships. So you're being kind of that double thing where you're like, okay, I'm being, or the win-win thing where I'm being responsible for the environment, but actually increasing relationships. Another fruit of the spirit is, uh, well, two of them, I, I think love and kindness, they're so intertwined, I don't think you can really separate them. Um, you know, and, and we're talking right there, love Jesus, love snow. Like, the love part of it is sometimes washed down in how we talk about things. So I kind of keep this definition of love in the back of my head that a pastor once told me. He's like, love is a demonstrated preference for others, even at great expense to oneself, 
by the help of the Holy Spirit. So as I ex- kind of express love to people, it just automatically comes out in kindness. And I'm hoping it's easy for us to love others in lift lines and in the terrain parks, coffee shops, the pub on, uh, what is it, Black Diamond Pub on Friday night, uh, in our churches, those kind of things. It's easy. I think that's really easy for us because the people are right in front of us. But what about loving others that are not in front of us? And how does that work? Um, One example is in our purchasing decisions. A lot of times, I'm even challenged with this, is I'm looking for the best deal for myself when I buy something. Is it on sale? How much am I going to save? But does that mean that everybody is going to be better off because of my transaction? And am I making people feel loved and am I extending acts of kindness to them when I buy something? So I got a scenario to run through. So yesterday, what time, like 12.30, I realized that I wasn't the only one that when I looked for a jacket that I need something really waterproof. Um, Yesterday, I think it was raining. I'm not sure if this is regularly, but man, it was deluging. And so when I, when I go and buy a jacket, the one thing living in the Pacific Northwest of the United States is I need something that's going to be waterproof and I, need, I want something that's going to be durable. So when I was looking at buying this jacket, there was a bunch of things going on and I walked past one shop and there was a, there was a jacket in the, in the rack and it was $100 suggested retail cheaper than this jacket. And it was 30% off. And so... Right away, I'm like, okay, I should buy that. But as I start looking through the details of the, the other jacket, I started having to ask questions. Should I buy it? Well, the price is right, but what are the details of that jacket? So how durable was it? What materials were it made of? Where was that jacket produced? Is there very many outerwear companies that still produce in the United States? Okay, if it's the other jacket, this jacket wasn't produced in the United States, but the, the other jacket wasn't too. So what are the standards of that country where it's produced? Does the factory follow those standards? What about the treatment of their workers? Pollution? And I was perplexed by the idea that a lot of times the pollution that comes out of the dyes that were for the products that we want for jackets and clothing, they pump it into the rivers the rivers that the people that work in that factory are in and around and fishing and eating out of. So that led me to the question, was the blue blue sign certified? And we'll talk about that in the breakout. Like, what does blue sign even mean? What's the company and the supplier's environmental and social stances, the spiritual stances? And even on a local level, when I buy something that's on sale... Does that mean that the sale price, it really means that that shop owner might not make money on that specific item. And so when I'm hanging out with um, Mikey from the snowboard shop and I like him a lot, but I'm not willing to pay something for full price. Mikey works in the snowboard shop. Like, what am I really saying to Mikey? And I worked in a shop a lot and we'd have those customers and I knew those customers that would come in looking for the deal all the time. And it was just that awkward social part of it. And that's, you know, that's just the jacket I bought. So I really hope that we can kind of look at that and go, what does it mean to look at the thousands of other purchases we make in a year? It's hard to make wise purchases but there are things that industries are doing to help us with that. There's the Hig Index, there's Blue Sign products, there's all this kind of stuff. And, and I'll talk more about that in the breakout. But what I really want is that when you make a purchase, think about how that's going to allow me to show God's love and kindness to those people that are in our communities. Not only those ones, but the ones that are around the world. So I don't think being socially and environmentally responsible are two separate aspects of a Christian walk. I think as we live those out and we practice those both, 
it's really loving our neighbors well. And so in the, I, I, there's a lot of things as I was looking at that, like how do we, how do I not separate being socially responsible, environmental, environmentally responsible? There's other gifts of the spirit that I want to go through in the breakout, so I hope that you come there. Um, here, show of hands, who's heard of Blue Sign before? Awesome. So I want to talk about that. Hig Index. Does anybody know what the Hig Index is? So that's coming up, and I want to talk about like what does that mean for the industry. Um, also, like what Capita Snowboards is doing is phenomenal. Um, Patagonia, I guess I'm wearing Patagonia pants. You know, what they've done and helped transform things. I want to talk about that. So not only just talk maybe a little bit more about the gifts of the spirit. Um, one is self-control. Um, and that's a tough one because from an environmental standpoint, I'm looking at like solar, wind, the electric car, like we're touting these things as really good things. But really, how does that help me exercise self-control? As a Christian, like I can jump in an electric car and it's not going to pollute as much. So I can keep on driving the way I do and my life doesn't change. So I want to talk about those things in the breakout. Um, hopefully you guys will kind of join me there.